Thank you so much for coming out on a cold night. <laughs> um, I just thought that um, it seemed that with um, the release of the book and with all of the politics around um, Beijing that there's been quite a lot of talk about sort of the events that led up to or what, what was going on with the boycott, um, sort of the day-to-day -day thing that happened in those months leading up to, to Moscow. So I thought that um, in t talking to you tonight I might just tell you some of the sort of stories about, well, first of all, you know, why it took 28 years to write the story, which seems to be a common question. And it's a good question. <laughs> um, basically, um, it began um, about 10 years ago. There was a woman called Belinda Bolliger who was the children's book author at Hotter Headline. And she had um, seen a, a, an article about me in the newspaper. It was in Spectrum. Um, it used to be sort of the broadsheet size. It used to be able to open up and there was something called a dateline. It was just a very basic um, dateline, you know, born 1964, um, 1972, joined the DY Ladies Amateur Swimming Club, um, you know, 1974, first date record, very basic sort of stuff. And she, um, she decided, or she called me and said, do you think that you could write a book based on your teenage years for teenagers? Now, I'd gone to the Olympic Games that no one wanted to talk to, uh, talk about, and I had certainly performed in a way that nobody, or that I didn't want to remember. So the idea that she thought that there was, you know, a book in that was quite surprising. But, um, I'd always wanted to write, and, um, I'd started, sort of scratching out, you know, a little story about sort of a, a young um, kind of protege, I suppose you could call it, or a ta talented teenager and, and what happened to that teenager when she didn't actually sort of pull off um, and and perform to her expectations. So so I, I knew that I wanted to write a book and so I said, okay, well, yeah, I'll give this a go. That, that sounds like a, you know, you never look a, a publishing contract, um, uh, look or turn away from one. So I said, okay. So that began this sort of process of looking back at my swimming career, which had happened, you know, very briefly, really compared to today's um, um, sports um, people, but it would have happened from 1978 to 1982, from the age of 14 to 18, and a career that I'd pretty quickly dismissed—not quickly dismissed, but I was, I was not um, all that um, generous to that young girl who had sort of represented Australia all those years ago. I, I didn't perform well in Moscow, and I'd, I used to have these. When we trained, we used to have these, um, you know, this was sports psychology back in the late 70s. We used to have these sort of um, sayings, you know, that were written on the top of the blackboard every time I trained. And so there were things like, um, uh, don't say can't, say can, um, define the moment or the moment defines you. And my own personal favourite was um, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And so uh, when it came to my Olympic performance, I'd always, I'd sort of put it down to, well, when the going got tough, I wasn't tough enough. And and I ran, you know, as much as I could to to get away from sport. And I, I wanted to prove that I was something else other than an athlete. So, um, so then I started as a 35 year old, of course, looking back at um, that 16 year old um, in a much more gentle way. Because when you're 16, you think you can cope with everything, and you should be able to cope with everything. And when you're 35, you go, Oh my God, 16 was so young. How did you go through all that? So I started um, uh, writing, making the most of it. The character was called Nina, and um, because of that, I started saying yes to functions that I'd, you know, previously run a million miles from, Olympic functions, um, like the um, first one was the one year out dinner um, before the Sydney 2000 Olympics. So it was September of 1999, and I went to this amazing function at the uh, at the Darling Harbour Convention Centre, and it was enormous. The, the room was enormous, and there were tables, you know, the, t the room was full of tables where companies had paid $10,000 to sit with an Olympian. And so it was this fantastic event. The theme of the night was inspiration. And all through the night, at the back of the room, um, different um, well-known Australian athletes got up onto these little podiums and had the spotlight on them, and they talked about what inspired them. So it was Kieran Perkins and Ian Thorpe and the Roy Crofts and, you know, this sort of great, all of the greats in Australian sport that you've ever seen. So it was very exciting. But all through this night, we were theme was inspiration. They kept talking about this proud record that we had of going to every games of the modern Olympiad, that only Greece shared this record. And Australia had this very proud record of going to every games of the modern Olympiad. Not only that, it had been one of the crucial uh, or deciding factors when it came to us getting the games in Sydney. We, we beat Beijing at the time. And, and one of the reasons or, you know, one of the things that got us over the line was this record. We have been to every games of the modern Olympiad. So I sat there as a Moscow Olympian knowing that there was a moment when that record had almost been broken. And I think it's really interesting that on this night when the theme is inspiration that, 
you know, that that isn't mentioned, that there was a moment when this was nearly broken and yet we managed to, there was an inspiring team that kept hold of that record. And, and adding to that was um, during the night there was a, a, a loop of uh, medal-winning performances um, of Australians at the Olympics. And I didn't see, I, I went to the bathroom twice, so it might have happened, you know, while I was out, but I did not see the gold medal of Michelle Fords. She won an 800, the 800 metres. I didn't see the 4 by 100 medley relay team once on that loop. That's strange, but it was such a fantastic night. And John Farnham saying, you're the voice of the big brass Scottish band. And, you know, we all sort of went out of the room just so sort of thrilled that I came home to my husband and I said, gee, people think going to the Olympic Games is a really big deal. He said, Dale, you're the only one who doesn't. <laughs> so I <laughs> took that lesson and went to the six-month-out dinner, which was um, at the Aces Stadium or the, the um, Superdome. And it was the same thing, an enormous room filled with tables and people had paid $10,000 to sit with an Olympian. A lot of pressure on you to be really sparkling entertainment when someone's paid that much sort of money to sit with you. But um, same again, the theme of the night was inspiration. The record again was mentioned of this proud record that we have and that it helped us get to the Sydney 2000 Games and only Greece and Australia share that record. And, and the 56 Olympians were brought up on stage as the inspiring team. and um, And... This room was so enormous. I mean, I mean, I was on the edge with the CSR, which, um, the company called CSR. Now, I'm your garden variety Olympian. You know, I've been in a final at an Olympic Games. But on one side of me, also on the edge of the room, was Michelle Ford, who won the gold medal against the East Germans. Now, back in the, one of the things that we've always had to sort of rise above when it came to the Moscow Olympics was that it wasn't a real competition. People say, well, because the Americans weren't there, it wasn't really a real Olympic Games. Yet there was Michelle Ford who won a gold medal and beat the East Germans when no one was beating the East Germans. You know, a very high quality event. She was on this edge of me, on this side of me. And on this side was Max Metzger who won a bronze medal in the 1500 metres that year when Vladimir Salnikov went under 15 minutes for the first time. So again, an incredibly high, qual high calibre event. And we were on the edge of this table and inside there's other athletes, many of them not even Olympians, that are sitting closer to the you know, the centre of the room. And I went home to my husband again and I said, God, what do you think that your own Olympic committee would know? That, you know, when they're talking about inspiration, that here we are, there's a team that held on and kept that record intact. What do you think there's an inspiring story about them? Bring in a company, they don't know about it and, and they, you know, make up the night with the things that they know. Okay, fair enough. So then um, the Making the Most of It, which was the name of my teenage novel, came out just before the Olympic Games and it was very well received and um, it went on to the um, the um, recommended reading list um, for years seven to ten from the Department of Education, and everybody, you know, it, it was, um, everybody loved the book. And and so um, my I got a call from a company who puts um, authors into schools, and they talk about you know how they wrote a book sort of thing, or talk to the teenagers about how they you know came to write a book. And so this company called and said, "Do you want to do it?" And I said to my husband, you know, well, what am I going to tell them about? And he said, "Dale." Tell them your story. I said, well, teenagers don't want to know about history. You know, I'd, I'd set making the most of it in the modern context. Nina Hallett, the main character, was a professional swimmer. She had nothing to do. It wasn't the same as what it was like for us. I said, Dal, I said, no one wants to know about history. Nobody wants to talk about Moscow. And he said, Dal, just tell them your story. And so I started talking to year nine boys <laughs> at high school. <laughs> Not the easiest audience. <laughs> But I started telling them this story. Now, first of all, they cannot believe that there was a time when we didn't win loads of gold medals at the Olympic Games. That's a shock to them. They cannot believe there was a time where an athlete wasn't paid to do what they do. They can't believe there's a time when very few athletes reached their peak, which any year nine boy can tell you was 23. <laughs> the idea that you had to go somewhere else, that if you were going to really do it, you had to go to a college in America to really stay in your sport. I can't believe that. And then, you know, I started telling them the story about a time when the federal government tried to stop us from going to the Olympic Games. They, they not only tried to stop us, they paid, in the amateur days of sport, they paid sports associations and they paid um, individual athletes not to go, to stay away from the Games. They can't believe that there was a time when the media of the day campaigned against an Olympic team, that the Daily Telegraph said that, we should have our passports taken away from us because an Australian passport is a privilege, not a right. That the shock jocks, particularly the famous ones in Melbourne, were saying that we were the supporters of the murderers of children in Afghanistan. Um, that 
the captain of the swimming team had a whistle by her telephone because that's the way that our death threats came, that her mother took one of these phone calls, that her sister, who was only 11 and in and sixth grade at, at primary school, took one of the phone calls and that she was called a communist in the, the schoolyard and that the parents had to, that the teachers actually had to, you know, patrol the schoolyards in a much more careful way during that period because Jane bore the brunt of the of the comments that were coming from their parents. You know, I think I went to, you know, I was in high school, so teenagers are much more um, likely to disagree with their parents even. <laughs> so if their parents didn't think I should go, I didn't hear about it because my, my friends were all very supportive. But for my sister, it was a very different story. But, you know, that was only one of the forms of intimidation, that Max Metzger, the men's captain, got letters saying that he was worse than the sewage being pumped into Maroubra Beach for wanting to go, that um, uh, athletes um, who worked in jobs, the athletes that did work, worked in situations where um, they worked for banks, for instance, who would give them leave without pay to go and work. And some of those athletes didn't know, number one, whether they would be given leave this time because they depended on what side of the um, argument their boss sat or if they'd have a job to come back to. Um, but one of the athletes, a shooter, a woman called Bon Hill, who um, lived in um, Adelaide, um, was uh, actually went to the Supreme Court in the end for the right to go to the Olympic Games because the shooting team was one that was going to support the government and had agreed to take the $45,000 as compensation. Um, and so at the last minute she served an injunction against, the, against her um, association. She won the right to go in the Supreme Court and on the Wednesday after that decision, she went to the Adelaide Small Ball Pistol Club where she'd been a member for 20 years and no one spoke to her, including her family. <laughs> and that was the kind of stuff that was going on. And so the kids are, were stunned. I, I, was, I was talking to a, a stunned group of students. And I, at first I said to the teachers, oh, my God, I'm boring them. And she said, they're, so, you're not boring them. They're hanging on to every word. You know if they were bored. And so sort of. With that confidence, I then started speaking to adult groups and started telling them the story. And, and inevitably, um, the adults that I, that I spoke to could remember the Olympic Games. They could remember the opening ceremony. What they remember from Moscow is the opening ceremony, Misha the Bear, the, the great mascot, the first mascot that, you know, the Olympics ever had. Um, they remember, um, in, at the opening ceremony, there was this great wall, a tapestry of moving cards that kept changing picture as the, as the opening ceremony happened. They remember that. Um, they remember the song that Channel 7 used, Moscow, Moscow. Da, 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 da. <laughs> it's hard to get out of your brain once you had a lot. But they don't remember, they didn't remember the politics. No one remembered that there was this sort of incredible upheaval in the six months before the AOF decided six we'd been going through. And so in about 2005, my, um, I was talking to my book agent about sort of what to write next. And I said to her, well, you know, there's a song, so there's a story that I that I keep telling, and it seems to get a really good reaction, you know, from the audience that I speak to. And I told her about it, and she said, "Lisa, put that down on paper. You will pay for your renovations with that story." <laughs> and so I did, but it didn't. <laughs> In fact, only the ABC would publish it. Everybody else said we cannot sell that book. No one will be interested in that story. And so, even for a while, the ABC are notoriously slow with contracts. So. But it was such an emotional kind of book to read and it was so intimidating right from the beginning. For a few months there, I thought, oh, good, I won't have to write it because the contract, <laughs> the check hasn't come and I, the contract hasn't arrived. But inevitably it did, so I had to, um, I had to write the book. And it was very, um, I, I think I probably knew over those years just how difficult it would be. I would interview um, different people. Um, I interviewed Phil Noyce once, the Australian director, and he was on the line from Los Angeles. I kept palm, trying to palm off this story. I said, you know, there's this story that you should – you should look into, and it's about the Moscow Olympians, and it's this proud record, and da 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 And he thought, who is this mad woman on the end of the line in Sydney? But um, And I think that I, I, I avoided it because I knew that it would be um, difficult from, from a, couple, a number of angles. It was emotionally a very difficult thing to write about. I mean, making the most of it had been a gentle look at, at my swimming career, but this was the nuts and bolts of pretty much the saddest time of my life. and and. It was intimidating politically because it was a very political story. It was about the, polit the not only the federal politicians but about the politics of sport. What I learned writing this book is that everyone can talk about, you know, there should be no sport in politics, which is totally different to the politics of sport. And so I'm, I, I've got a great friend, David Ma, who's a senior journalist, and I, I would say to him often, you know, you should be writing this story. You should be, t you should be speaking to these people. And he said, they won't talk to me like they will talk to you. And so, you know, that kind of kept me going. But I, it wasn't as though another point when it was very bad and I was, you know, in tears. My 
I said to my husband, um, you know, I don't think I can write this. And he said to me, Dale, don't you think Dave gets emotional when he's writing a book about the Tampa? I said, Dave wasn't on the Tampa. <laughs> That's what I felt like I was when, when, you know, when I was writing the book. Um, I s- thought for some reason that, um, the first person that I should interview after about a month of research was the Prime Minister himself, Malcolm Fraser. So um, I took myself down to Melbourne. I'd been to the State Library for about a month. I thought, oh, yeah, I've got enough now to go and talk to him. So I wrote him a letter, and to his credit, within a week, he'd said yes. Um, his office had called and said, Mr. Fraser will speak to you. And so I went down to Collins Street, and just on the weekend before, there was a um, this, one of the magazines, um, Sunday magazines, had a profiled a number of senior journalists and asked them who they thought was the most intimidating politician that they'd ever had to interview. (laughs) Kerry O'Brien said Malcolm Fraser (laughs) because of his height. (laughs) So my mum called and said, did you see the article in the paper? Wear high shoes. (laughs) Which I did, but am I bumping that microphone? Sorry. (laughs) Um, um, So I, I did wear high shoes, but I was, it's okay, I was so I um but I was still very nervous and I was outside his Collins Street office in the cafe across the road wondering whether or not to have a coffee would that make me more jittery you know and I called uh called Jess my husband and said you know Dal I'm I, what, what am I going to do he said Dal just remember you are the captain of the swimming team he tried to stop going to Moscow he's going to be just as nervous as you are <laughs> but he wasn't but he was still very very generous and he I was fascinated I mean at the same time that he was trying to stop the AOF um, or at least influence the AOF and get them to vote for a boycott. He was going to Harare, to Zimbabwe, for Independence Day celebrations that he had been quite, you know, a part of. He had managed to convince Margaret Thatcher to change her policy in Rhodesia, and yet he wasn't able to convince the AOF to do his bidding. And so I was quite interested in how frustrated he was. Of course, he, so he wasn't. It was just, he was just following policy, following what the Americans, we had to be a good ally. But over the time since I've interviewed him, he has said, even um, with the crackdown in Beijing, he has said on Melbourne radio that the policy was wrong. I was desperate for him to say that to me, but <laughs> he didn't say that. Or maybe sorry, I don't know. <laughs> um, but he wasn't as difficult to interview as um, a man called Bob Ellicott, who was Fraser's Home Affairs Minister. Now, maybe I went in a little less prepared because Ellicott had apologised twice during 2006 to the um, 1980 Olympians. He'd apologised at the 25th anniversary of the AIS. Um, and at the 50th anniversary of the Melbourne Olympics. Um, and so he'd said, you know, he apologised to the athletes of 1980 for interrupting their training. And when I met him, he was very, very generous. He's very flattering. He's nearly 80 years old, a very, very eloquent, smooth and flattering man. And he kept saying to me that I must, I, we should be recognised that, you know, what we went through and, and the way that um, what happened in Moscow essentially leveraged, you know, put more money into sport and more money particularly into the Institute which he is the architect of, um, and everyone will tell you that. All of the sports administrators that I spoke to, they said Bob Ellicott was a dinky dime man and that he was the man who got the Institute of Sport up and running. Basically, we're all at a, you know, just one of those strange coincidences. The boycott of 1980 happened at the same time that we were, we'd bottomed out when it came to Australian sport. 1976 was the worst performance by an Olympic team for four decades. We failed to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. And it caused a whole lot of soul searching within the community and a lot of the newspapers um, and carried lots and lots of stories about how important gold medals were to us. And um, and a lot of that, there was a, a uh, Morgan Gallup poll um, revealed that 75% of Australians would be happy for more taxpayer-funded dollars to go to sport in order for us to get back up to the top of the world. And so um, nothing much had been done. As Malcolm, Ellico- uh, Malcolm Fraser said to me, um, we, I didn't have a GST, Lisa. There wasn't just that much money around. So I couldn't immediately put together an institute, institute of sport. But in 1978, at the Commonwealth Games in Edmonton, we were defeated by Canada. I won a silver medal there. So personally, it was very you know, successful for me as a 14-year-old. But the team lost to Canada, who was trained by Don Talbot. So not only were we losing, we were losing to our own people, you know, our own experts that were being taken elsewhere in the world. So at the end of 78, Bob Ellicott, our Home Affairs Minister, was given sport as the portfolio and asked to do something about it. And he was the, um, because he was the Minister for Home Affairs, he had the territories. And so he was essentially the Mayor of Canberra. And um, he had access to what was called the National Capital Development Scheme. So he could get money for the Institute of Sport without going to cabinet for approval. And people like John Devitt have saw him, witnessed him 
write a letter to himself. You know, we need eighty-five thousand dollars for the um, a new floor in the basketball court, and he'd sign a letter saying, "Yes, you do. Here's your money." <laughs> and so everybody says he had the he had the way of doing it. He knew what to do, and he can tell you all about it. His his memory on setting up the Institute of Sport is fantastic, and he loves to tell you about it. But the moment that you try to ask him about a phone call that he made at four in the morning, or this was four in the morning in Mexico, when the president of the Australian Shooters Union was in Mexico at a at a international shooting union conference, and he picked up the phone at four in the morning to have the Home Affairs Minister on the other end saying, what are you going to do? Are you going to take the money and support the government stand for a boycott? Put that to Mr. Ellicott, and his mind's a blank. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't deny that I did it, Lisa. You know, I don't, I don't say that I didn't do it. If the man said I did it, then I must have, but I can't remember it. Ask John Devitt. Ask this person. <laughs> and so, an hour, 45 minutes of trying to get him to speak about the, about the policy. You know, was it, did you approach all of the sports and offer them money? Was it a systematic approach? Did you just approach the sports that you knew would support the government at first? How much money did you offer? Did it have to change, you know, once the AOF had voted for us to go? Nothing. So at the end of a very frustrating hour, it was also it was about a four o'clock in the afternoon that I that I met him and a very frustrating hour as I was packing up. Oh well, I, I hadn't quite packed up the tape because the the, the um, quote was still there, but he said something at the end that was like a kick in the stomach, right as 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 I, as I was quite sort of a bit tense anyway, because I hadn't been able to get too much. He said, Lisa, the boycott worked. It wasn't the Olympic Games that I would like to go to. As a sports minister, that would have happened. And that's all I heard. The rest of it, which is sort of in the last chapter of the book, was the boycott worked. It wasn't the Olympic Games that I would like to go to, but it didn't work in the Australian context because of the trouble that it caused within sport and the rifts that it caused within sport. I didn't hear that bit. I just heard the first bit. Boycott worked, Lisa. It wasn't the Olympic Games that I would like to go to. In my... In 26 years, as it was at that point, since I'd gone to the Olympic Games, I'd never uttered those words. I'd never admitted those words to myself, let alone uttered them. And yet here was this man just so casually saying, wasn't the Olympic Games I'd like to go to. It was such a kick in the stomach. And I could not wait to get out of that office. It wasn't the Olympic Games I would like to go to either, but it was the one that I had to go to and that was the way that it was. I had got out of that office and still he was, you know, what a shame we can't get cabinet papers and, you know, if, if I can help you with anything else, let me know. And I was getting down to the bottom of Martin Place and just wanting to get away. And I got around the corner and sat down. It was just before Christmas. It was my dad's birthday. We were heading over to mum and dad's that night for dinner. And I couldn't move. I had to call my husband and people are flying past doing Christmas shopping and all that sort of stuff. And he came to get me and just sort of took me back to the car. And I, and I cried for the night, rest of the night. It was just that thing that you never wanted to say to yourself that that, that he had so casually said that was was shocking. Um, but at the same time, um, the response from the athletes and from the um, from the parents and from the partners of the athletes that had gone to 1980 was so often so positive and so often, thank goodness you're telling the story. Thank goodness we're finally able to talk about this. The hockey women, the first there was a great woman called Daphne Peary who was one of the administrators, said to me. Thank goodness you're telling this story, Lisa, because people will listen to you. And the hockey women had one of the saddest stories. They were it was the first time that hockey was going women's hockey was going to be at the Olympic Games. And many women had hung in and played hockey for Australia for many, many years and had hung in for the opportunity to run onto an Olympic field and to say they'd played at the Olympics. There was a woman called Di Gorman who um, was from Wollongong. And she was the best hockey player in the world. Everybody said that when there was these, these world championships that would come around every couple of years, and Australia were always in the top four. And at the end of these meets, they would choose a World eleven. and Di Gorman's name was always first. She was, all, she was the greatest hockey player in the world, and so she hung around just waiting for the opportunity to play. And they were told, or girls and the men were told. I mean, Rick Charlesworth was in the team. They were, they'd won a silver medal in, um, Los An in um, Montreal. They were hoping to go one better in in Moscow, same thing, a lot of those players that hung around for Moscow because they would have an experienced team. They were all told that if the AOF voted to go to the Olympic Games, then hockey would go. They were promised that. They were asked, do you still want to go? The competition's going to be less. They said, yes, we want to go to the Olympic Games. The AOF voted on the Friday, May the 23rd, 6-5, that we'd go. On the Monday, the women read about in the newspaper that they'd been withdrawn. The men 
got a, uh, got wind of a of a, a special um, and the special um, general meeting that was being called. Rick Charlesworth tried to speak at the meeting. He couldn't. He talked to the Western Australian delegate. He felt that he had his support, but he didn't know. They got a letter at least saying that in the interest of Australian hockey, um, it was better that they withdrew. The men got a hundred thousand dollars. The women got forty five thousand. Not individually, they it was put towards their team for a, for a trip that happened. But the the amount of money changed enormously once that six five decision happened. So the yachtsmen that went out the, were, were withdrawn again with no consultation from the athletes at all to, to their athletes. It was um they it was announced in Parliament on the first of April that they would take forty five thousand dollars from the government. After the six five vote, hockey got one hundred and forty five, equestrian one hundred and twenty five, um, um, volleyball. A team that hadn't even qualified for the Olympic Games got $125,000 not to go. And so even for someone like, not only Di Gorman, as a young girl in that hockey team, Sharon Simpson, she made the team, it was her first Australian team. She represented Australia for the next three years and missed out on selection for 1984. She's never, she's not recognised by our Olympic Committee as an Olympian. Those athletes who were withdrawn by their associations and were never represented again are not recognised. When everyone was being asked to run with the torch for, for 2000, they weren't invited. <laughs> and yet Bob Ellicott, architect of the Institute of Sport, is recognised by our Olympic Committee as a friend of sport. <laughs> um, and so um, it's when, uh, as difficult as it was, when you're getting responses like that, where people are saying, you know, thank goodness you're writing this book, it made it much easier to write. And, and I've had some great um, letters since the book has been written. I got a lovely card last week. There was a man called David McKenzie who was the vice president of the Australian Olympic Federation and he was the IOC delegate. And there were two IOC delegates that eventually fought it out in Australia. Kevin Gosper was one and David McKenzie was the other. And, and Kevin Gosper um, originally was against the boycott in February when they went to the lake to Lake Placid. Um, through March, Bob Ellicott went to visit him, offered him chairmanship of the... Um, AIS that was about to open, you know, in the next 12 months. And then over the next period, um, got Kevin Gosper changed his mind and decided to vote for, go with the government. And so David McKenzie and Kevin Gosper were at loggerheads. They were the two youngest, two of the youngest men on the, on the AOF. These men were in their 40s, whereas most of them were in their 60s. And so they were closest to, to sport. And David McKenzie in particular was an incredibly powerful man in terms of changing sport in Australia. He did a lot of work for um, a guy called Dennis Tuddy. He went to the High Court for a football player called Dennis Tuddy. And um, had um, it was a landmark case as far as trade practices go, and allowed Dennis Tuddy and the footballers after him to apply their trade and to actually move around from club to club uh, rather than the club owning them. So he was always in it for sport. And David McKenzie died a year after the um, a year after the boycott or the, the attempted boycott uh, in mysterious circumstances in 1981. And I got a lovely card from his daughter last week saying that just she and her mum had read the book together and had given them an opportunity to reminisce about um, what had happened and a chance to talk about Dad. And she thanked me for, for um, giving her some more stories because the old ones were getting taller with each, <laughs> with each telling. Um, and I got a letter from a guy called Robert Cabas, who was a weightlifter, an email from him the other day. He's in Beijing at the moment working as a graphic, graphic designer now, so he's working with, the, um, with a media organisation over there. But he wanted me to know that um, he has one memory of the, institute, of, of the boycott he was called at seven in the morning um, by the Herald at the time. He was pretty angry, and he just said to the guy, he said to the reporter, "Look, I just wish you know the AOF would stop acting like, acting like a pack of old goats and make a decision." So of course the headline was, <laughs> "Cabas calls AOF old goats," <laughs> and he got a phone call from Chris Wardlaw, who was the main lobbyist for the athletes, and who thanked him for his determination to get to Moscow, but politely suggested that perhaps calling the AOF the <laughs> pack of old goats wasn't going to help us. Um, but the nicest letter, or the most interesting letter, came also from a woman who was a historian, um, and she went to Moscow in 1983, and she just wanted me to know that not only that she liked the book, but that she wanted to relate her story. When they went in 1983, she was mostly with American and British historians, but once the Russians found out that she was Australian, she was like the star of the team. She became the celebrity of the group, because the, the Russians... Um, remembered the Australian swimmers, they remembered the 4 by 100 medley team, the men, they thought they were all gorgeous, um, and they thought that we were very friendly. They were so thrilled that we had recognised that they were a proud people before communism had taken over their country. And um, and so every time she was, you know, a new interpreter or anyone came on the two, she was introduced and everyone made a fuss of her and she just wanted me to know that the Olympics had done what they were supposed to do and they'd brought two countries together that um, would normally not have been able to sort of communicate. So. 
Um, that's just you know a little bit about 